And it can at times be occurring in your life and in your world. So there's, there's an extreme relevance here of learning something today that could deliver you, I believe, from much pain. So we're going to look at four key things. And the first thing we'll look at is the wrath, the very wrath of God. Then we're going to look at why wrath happens. And the passage describes three reasons why it happens, and that is rejection, rebellion, and then there is this increased rotting, this rotting immorality that happens in people who have rejected him and rebelled against him. So that is essential focus. Now I, I want to stress this to you that the <coughs> wrath of God and this process of rejection, rebellion, and rotting can uh, occur with individuals. It can occur with just an, an individual person, a man or woman who rejects the very revelation of God, rebels against God, okay, will experience this wrath and this rotting. It's a rotting of the human soul. Entire cultures can reject God. And they will experience uh, rebellion, and then they will experience rotting. If, if you study, if you student history, you can look at multiple civilizations. I mean, if you go to the biblical civilizations, Egypt was one of the great empires in the world. Now it's this little third world country. Babylon was this great empire of the world. Now it's, you know, it's gone. It's, it's, it's Iraq. Again, a third world country. And you look at the, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, look, look at the Roman Empire, and you get a, a great picture of this. Well, the Roman Empire started with incredible nobility. The first 100 years of the, noble, uh, of the Roman Empire, there was not one case of divorce in the entire empire, the family, marriage, children were, were held in, in, in high regard and esteem, and the empire was built upon strong uh, moral values. Now, the Romans conquered the Greeks, but the Greek culture conquered the Romans. And the Romans began to adopt worshiping the Greek gods, Zeus and Epaphrodite, Diana, Artemis. They began to take on the, the whole body focus of the Greeks and uh, lust and sexual pleasure. Immorality began to permeate the entire empire. And you see that as we come to the, the New Testament. You see it in the Gospels and you also see it throughout the epistles. The Roman Empire was, was fallen. Uh, a man... In the time of Jesus, and this is what one of the philosophers said, he would have a wife to have children, a concubine that he would associate with and discuss things with, and then he would have a prostitute that he would have sexual relations with. That was a, a, a typical of, of a man in the time of the Roman Empire. Rome became corrupt politically. They uh, adopted the arena games and uh, the gladiators, and then just bringing people, like Christian people, who they disagreed with and feeding them to the lions, while the crowds cheered on. The sport and games took control of the entire empire. There were more slaves in the Roman Empire than there were Roman citizens. And a Roman father, when his child was born, the child would be placed at his feet. And if he found a defect in the child, he would have the child killed or just abandoned in a, a wooded area. So Rome, Rome didn't fall from its invasion of the barbarians. Rome fell from within morally. And I think there's, there's a, a tremendous amount of comparison between the Roman Empire and our United States of America right now. I'll tell you something. If I was walking in the spirit, and I really knew what was happening, I would be on my knees praying for this country every day. Because I believe this country is on short notice right now from God. The wrath of God and this whole process will happen with nations. Nations that reject God, nations that, that turn towards rebellion, and then nations that get caught up in this rottenness of immorality 
again, it can happen. And again, you look at the United States. We, we, in the 1960s, our government turned its face on God. They basically eliminated prayer in the public schools. The Ten Commandments were removed from the public circle. Anybody who grew up, or you know, I was young in the 1960s, but I mean, it was just an incredible turning away from Judeo-Christian values, which created this massive vacuum that became filled with secular humanism, the New Age movement, the occult, idolatry, drugs, sexual immorality, materialism, and just we see that, that the result of this is a rottenness in this country. Abortion is made legal in 1973 with R.B. Wade. Uh, the porn industry explodes. Our prisons, our prisons, and we can't keep up with the prison population. We have to continuously be building new prisons. And this is, again, something that really a trend that happened with the rejection of God in the 1960s. What happens, you know, it is where, where sometimes we're like the frog in a kettle. Many of us don't see it. You know, you're in the frog in the kettle, you turn up the heat, the frog doesn't know it's getting hotter and hotter until eventually it dies and it's boiled to death. But we're a frog in the kettle in this country right now, and the heat is being turned up. And many of us, we're desensitized to what is happening. Uh, but if you look at America, even from year to year, or decade to decade, you see this, this decadency that we have, we have fallen into. This, this, again, principle of the wrath of God with rejection and rebellion, it can also occur to a world. And if you, you know the scriptures and the prophecies, Revelation chapter 6 through 19, it, it talks about this very thing. God pours out his wrath on the world in the end times. And from Revelation 6 to 19, you see that wrath being poured out, and it's poured out because of man's rejection of him and man's rebellion. But the rottenness, and where man finally falls to before God comes and puts an end to it, is, is I mean, he's as rotten as he can get. He's totally given himself over to Satan. Now, let's take number one here today. I'm going to just focus on number one and two. Wrath, and then we're going to look at re rebellion. And I want to stress this. There's a misunderstanding that many Christians have about the wrath of God. And I think many times they think of it as, as, as a lightning bolt. Like, like God, somebody does something wrong and God sends a lightning bolt and, and, and strikes them. And that's, that's not quite how it works. If you know the passage that I just read to you, when people fall into immorality, that is the wrath of God. <coughs> God has abandoned them. The people who turn, people who turn, I mean, it could be sexual immorality, it could just be a, a, the, the love of money, the materialism, uh, the occult. That is, that is a picture of someone who has essentially been abandoned by God. He gave them up, and they have fallen into this, this gross decadency and rottenness. And that's really what the passage is saying. So, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So the wrath of God, the word, the word is bourgeois, and what it carries with, again, this, this principle of God's wrath working, and again, it's working on people who are basically ungodly and unrighteous. Now, I want you to understand this. There is the wrath of God. Who else has wrath? Devil. Satan has wrath. There is the wrath of Satan. Revelation chapter 12, 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and ye that dwell in them, woe for the earth and for the sea, because the devil is gone down unto you, having great wrath, knowing that he hath but a short time. So there, there is the wrath of Satan. So you have the wrath of God, the wrath of Satan. Who else can display wrath? Man. Yeah. James chapter 1, 20. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You see, the wrath of man, look at the world. I know Satan has his, his claws in the whole thing, but you look what's happening in Syria and Iraq. Hey, folks, the Christian church is gone. The genocide has occurred. There, there's a handful of Christians left in Syria and Iraq. They've been murdered or driven out. You don't hear anything from the media about that of the United Nations. Nothing. But that, that, is, that is a picture of the, the, the wrath of man. Rapes, genocides, murder. 
What's going on in our inner cities in this country is, is an is a example of the wrath of man. So you have the wrath of God, the wrath of Satan, and the wrath of man. I want to focus on the wrath of God. So again, I, I want to emphasize this. The wrath of God, and listen, please listen to this. This will change your lives. I believe it will bring the fear of the Lord into your life, and that is the one great fear that dispels all of the fears. The wrath of God is a principle that operates in the universe. It is the consequence of rejection of God. It is a, a, essentially a revelation, and it operates on essentially people who have rebelled and rejected God. When a person rebels and rejects God, this automatically, this principle automatically kicks in. So do you understand that the concept of a, of a principle? It is a fundamental law that's just written in essentially the fabric of the economy or the existence that we have, much like gravity. Gravity is a, a universal law, right? Essentially, what goes up, what? Must, Must come down. down. That's a, a universal principle. So you have a person who jumps off of a 10-story building. God doesn't say, oh man, that person is made me mad. He's going to kill himself. I'm going to zap him. No, that's, that's not the way that it happens. Why? Because there is, again, there is a principle that is working. And the man who, who jumps off of the building, essentially, I mean, we'd say he's demonstrating the law of gravity. It's there. So this isn't God saying, I'm, I'm going to zap him with a lightning bolt and kill him. It's just simply a law. He, he essentially he has broken the law of gravity, and he will reap the consequences. When you break certain laws of God, you automatically reap the consequences. God gets on his motorcycle. He drives at 100 miles an hour into a stone wall. God does not kill him. What, you know, what kills him? The, 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 law, the law of entropy, the law of speed... He's traveling at 100 miles an hour on this vehicle, hitting an object that's unmovable. It's not God killing him. Again, it is the law, the principle that God has established. So Galatians chapter 6, 7 and 8, you can compare this. Right? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Simple principle. That, that, that is the law of God's wrath. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. You call it, and, and I like to call it, the boomerang effect. You ever throw a boomerang? What happens when you throw a boomerang? It comes back. It comes back to you. I remember when I was a kid, my friend, my, my best friend growing up, Mark Benevento and I were playing in his backyard, this boomerang throwing us comes back. His brother Louis, who was always bullying us and beating us up, he comes up, by the way, I led Louis to the board and did his wedding here at the church. But Louis was the bully. And uh, he used to beat us up all the time. And Louis comes and he just takes it out of Mark's hand and he goes and he throws it. And it goes all the way out and it comes back. And all of a sudden, man, he's like, he starts running, hits him right in the head. It was great! <laughs> it's the law of reaping and sowing. What do the Hindus call it? Karma. They call it karma. And that is not to build your, your faith on, on, on Hinduism, polytheism, or pantheism, but essentially what they're doing is they're observing a law that Yahweh has established. That essentially what you sow, you're going to reap. And that is the, the wrath principle. It is a principle. A lot of times when, when God is dealing with us in our lives, Right? And this wrath principle is working automatically. God, why are you doing this to me? God, why are you picking on me? Stop and look at yourselves. It's the principle of God that he has set up in the universe. Number two here, letter B. The wrath of God, there is a, a present wrath, there is a eternal wrath, and there's a future wrath. So the present wrath, I believe, is what is being discussed here in Romans 1.18. It says, for the wrath of God is 
revealed. Not was revealed or not is going to be revealed. So this is not talking about future wrath. This is not talking about eternal wrath. This is now wrath that it basically is uh, something we can experience in this existence of time and space. It's around us and it can be in us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2.16 Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as also to fill up the measure of their sins. But it says, wrath, what? Has come upon them to the uttermost. And he's just saying that wrath is something that is a present reality. As soon as a person sins, wrath comes and enters their life. Now, I want to emphasize this to you. That is for the unsaved and for the saved. The present wrath of God is something we can experience now. Some of you are sitting there and saying, I know passages that say that we shall not experience wrath. Well, I'll show you those passages in a second, and if you would take the time to read it in its entirety, you will see that there is a present wrath that we as Christians can experience right now. And this is a major wake-up call for us, because I've watched people in this church who go through a number of difficult things, and they're there, and it's just kind of this, this laissez-faire, I got my head in the sand mentality. And it's like, folks, you need to take time to look at yourself to see that, that some of these things may be things that you're bringing on yourself. Now, it could be the devil bringing it on, too. And it could be things that just happen because we live in a fallen world. So not everything that bad that happens to us is directly connected Okay, with the wrath of God. But it is a principle that's operating for the unsaved and for the saved. The key, the key thing to look at is essentially, if you want to see this illustration, when we live in that circle of God's favor, that's a circle of mercy and forgiveness and grace and peace and joy and the relationship with God. That is the place where you will be, you will be saved. From the wrath of God. When you step out of that circle in disobedience, and I, again, the, the flames, I'm not talking about hell here. I'm talking about you will reap the consequences. It, it just naturally happens. I say, oh, well, I, again, I don't think that applies to believers. Well, do you know the scriptures? I want to show you this passage in Deuteronomy 3.26. I just read this yesterday, and I, I jumped on it. But the Lord was wroth. You know what that word is? That word, that word for wrath is, is speaking again. It's a bar and it's used for wrath. The word of wrath, uh, but your Lord, but the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter. What is that about? Moses struck the rock. God told him, Call the water forth from the rock. Moses is a leader, he's held. Highly responsible for what he does before the people. That's why if you want to be a leader in the church, take that to heart. You're going to be held to a much higher standard of judgment than other people. Moses strikes the rock. God says to him, you know what? Because you struck the rock, you're not going into the promised land. Moses is like, I want to go in the promised land. In Deuteronomy 3, he's begging God and saying, Lord, please let me go in the promised land. Let me just walk in the promised land. You know what God says? No, I don't want to hear any more of this. You're not. And that was the experience of the wrath of God in his life. How about David? A man after God's own heart who stepped out of the circle of God's favor and committed adultery with Bathsheba and then had her husband Uriah murdered. He eventually repented. Nathan came to him and pointed out his sin and he repented. Was that it? Was that it? You know what happened to him? Okay. And you talk about a ripple effect because it not only affected him but his entire family. David's great sin, 1 Samuel 11, consequences. The sword will never depart from your family. What do you see happening there? His one son kills his other son. Absalom eventually rebels against him, trying to kill him and overthrow him. His wives are taken in broad daylight by Absalom in his sexual relations with him. The death of his child. That's the picture of wrath. So, oh, that doesn't occur in the New Testament. It doesn't. Oh. Have you ever heard of the grim tale of Ananias and Sapphira? I personally believe they were believers who got disciplined. 
Look at the Corinthians who were turning the Lord's Supper into a drunken feast. What was God doing to them to discipline them? Some of them were sick. And some of them fell asleep. And I'm not talking about taking a nap. God went in there and he began to discipline them. So that doesn't happen today. It doesn't? Let me tell you about one summer here at Living Word Community Church where I saw God take home three brothers. And it was, I really believe, they were brothers who were saved, who God said, you want to continue in your sins like this? I'm taking you home. And I believe the wrath of God came upon them. And if you really, again, understand the wrath of God, it's actually an operation of his love. Next, the wrath of God is a future. It's a future wrath. So in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10, it says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, some people would look at that and say, well, that's talking about hell. I don't think that's talking about hell. First Thessalonians, every chapter of 1 Thessalonians deals with what? The rapture. The rapture. The entire book is centered on Jesus coming and taking his bride out. The rapture of the church. What happens after the rapture? Church is taken out, then you have what is called the tribulation. That's Revelation chapter 6 through uh, 19. And in the tribulation, you have the wrath of God being poured out. Right there in chapter 6, the wrath of God. And you have these judgments, seal judgments, trumpet judgments, and bowl judgments. But right there is the wrath of God. I believe what that is speaking of, the future wrath that's coming on the world, the tribulation period. And let me just say something to you. Some people are more terrified of the tribulation than they are of hell. I think that hell is going to be far worse than the tribulation. Though the tribulation will be a hell on earth. And it is, it is a frightening time. But I believe that the wrath of God that the scripture is talking about us being saved from is the future wrath of the tribulation. Then you have eternal wrath. And eternal wrath is hell, is eventually the lake of fire in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 10. Now, for God did not appoint us to wrath. And I believe this is talking about eternal wrath but to obtain salvation. And notice there's a parallel here between wrath and salvation. Eternal wrath and eternal salvation. As believers, we are not destined to experience eternal wrath, but eternal salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So that, I believe, is talking about the eternal wrath. Jesus described eternal fire. Matthew chapter 25, 41. Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You know, hell was never meant for people. Hell was meant for Satan and his angels. But when man rebelled, the doors opened. Total separation from God for an eternity. So what, watch this now. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all what? Godliness. Ungodliness and unrighteousness. What's ungodliness? Hey, how many of you have ever had one of these? Right? Have you ever had one of those? I'd recommend that you shouldn't have them because I believe you'll be going home to see him sooner than you need to by drinking that stuff. I realized that when my uncle he came over and he cleaned our toilet by pouring coke into the toilet, took all the scratches off. And I thought, man, what is that going to do for your stomach? Take the paint right off a car. But that's Coke. You know what Coke is? Coca, Coca what do we call it? Coca? Cola. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. What is that? That's a special cola, a special flavor of vanilla, cinnamon, citrus oils, and other hidden ingredients that they won't tell us. Coca-Cola. That's Coca-Cola. What is this? 7-Up is what? The the encola, <laughs> the encola, this big Jamaican dude. What does Coca Cola have that Seven Up doesn't have? Cola. Seven Up has no.
cola. No cola in Seven Up. It's the uncola. You can't find any cola in Seven Up. Right? So you have godliness. Right? Godliness then would be like Coca Cola. To have Coca Cola, you have cola. To have godliness, what do you have? God. You have God, His way, His will, His word. You're seeking Him. You're you're worshiping Him. You you desire Him. You have passion for Him. You're seeking to obey Him. That's that's godliness. What is ungodliness? It's to have nothing to do with God. If I'm a godly person, I want nothing to do with God, His word, His will, His way, His work. Nothing. You need people like that, right? They don't want anything to do with it. And what that leads to is unrighteousness. And unrighteousness, there's no righteousness of God in the person's life. They're not right with God, they're not right with the Son, they're not right with His word or His will. And that brings on the wrath of God. Now, rejection, okay, and essentially the wrath comes because of this rejection, which leads to rebellion and leads to rotting. Now, I want you to understand this. Romans 1 is talking about who? Jews or Gentiles? It's talking about Gentiles. Chapter 2 is talking about Jews. It's important to understand this. Essentially, what Romans 1 is talking about it is addressed to people who have never read the Bible or have never really understood Jesus. And that's what the passage is saying. So I want to show you something. This is really important. You have general revelation and specific revelation. God has revealed himself in two ways. One generally and one specifically. General revelation is simply nature, the universe, our conscience. God has revealed himself to all mankind, to the aborigine, to uh, the person who lives in China, who has been living under atheism, and maybe never has heard about Jesus or, or read the Bible. But he has revealed himself, his natural revelation, to them through creation, through the creation that is designed, and uh, through conscience. Special revelation is essentially the Bible. And Jesus. So Romans 1 is talking about, again, this general revelation. It's talking about natural revelation. And what the Holy Spirit is talking about here is coming to know God through the created universe, through reason. And that is the revelation to the Gentiles. So let me share with you, I want to share with you four ways that God reveals himself to people in this general sense. The first is what? I'm going to use big words here, so bear with me. Cosmological evidence. What is that? That's talking about the cosmos, the universe. So Romans chapter 1, 19 and 20, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You look up at the stars. You see this vast universe. Right? What do we see? This massive cause. Right? Massive effect. This massive, massive effect. And reason tells you if you have a massive effect, there must be a a massive cause, right? Whenever we, just reason tells us whenever we see an effect, there must be a cause, right? Cause always creates effect. And this effect is big and it's, it's awesome. And So there's this Englishman that I was witnessing to, I was in the Lord a very short time, he was working out in my fitness center and I sat in him one day and I, I said, do you believe in God? And he said to me that he had gone up to Mount Minatubo and climbed it to the top. And he said, when I stood there at the top of the mountain and I looked at this, this vast world and universe, he said, how could you not? He wasn't a Christian, but he understood 
that this vast universe couldn't have come about by chance. In Psalm chapter 19, 1 through 6, this is again a good picture of the cosmological evidence. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. And night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard, their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like the bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. And that is an amazing passage because when it was written, nobody had a clue that the sun was traveling, right? With the entire solar system traveling around it, and the entire solar system traveling around the galaxy, and the entire galaxy traveling through the universe, a circuit. Now, they wouldn't have deduced that, we have, because of modern science, but essentially the, the universe proclaims this great power. I don't even want to call it God. Just that there is a great infinite power that made all of this. That's what the passage is saying. And that is called the cosmological argument. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. That's simple. Now, take it another step further, what we call the teleological evidence. And that is the idea that there is evidence of design in the universe which suggests a designer. When you look closely at the universe, and you, and you don't need to be a scientist, but one thing that we have, the advantage of today with modern science, is there are thousands and thousands of principles and laws, mathematical laws and principles that govern the entire universe. In fact, they tell us today that the universe is digital, like a computer program. And if you were to see a computer program, what would you say? To, there's a computer program, there's an effect, there must be a computer program. Right? It couldn't have just happened by chance. So back in the 1800s, there is this argument by William Paley. And he used the illustration of a wristwatch. And he says, you know, if you look at a wristwatch, right, you have, you have the face of the watch, you have hands, you have the actual casing, and then you have all these little gears. It's amazing. They all have to be just precise. And they keep that clock right, right to a millisecond in a 365-day you know, year. So his reasoning was, if you were to see a watch, you would then deduce that there is a watchmaker, right? Now, there was a, a, a man named David Hum who was an atheist. And Hum argued with Paley, and he said, I would believe that to be true, with the exception that the watch the cells, and if we take one little cell, let me read this to you. This is quoted by uh, Chuck Missler, God bless him, God bless his soul, as Michael Denton, he says, who is a, uh, a scientist, has pointed out, although the tiniest bacterial cells are incredibly small, each is in effect a vertical micro-miniaturized uh, miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery made up of a 100 billion atoms, far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. Now watch what he says here. The simple cell turns out to be a miniaturized city of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design, including automated assembly plants and processing units featuring robot machines, protein molecules with as many as 3,000 atoms each in three-dimensional configurations, manufacturing hundreds of thousands of specific types of products, the system design exploits artificial languages and decoding systems, memory banks for information storage, elegant control systems regulating the automated assembly for components, error correction techniques, and proofreading devices for quality control. And if you tell me that that all happened by chance without a designer, how do you define absurd? <coughs> You can see what the scriptures say, we are wonderfully and marvelously made. How about the human brain? The human brain is far more complex than the most, than the most complicated uh, A-frame computer. 
And there are things that, that the human brain does that computers do, but there are things that computers can't do that the human brain does, like experience emotion and love. It, 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 it's truly miraculous. That's why if, if Stephen Hawking, who just passed away, he said, it would be very difficult to explain why the universe should have begun in just this way, except as the act of a God who intended to create beings like us. How about the human eye? You know, our, our human eye is far more complex than the most complex camera. Let me just read to you, I'll read you this quote about the human eye by Scott Huss. He says, furnished with automatic aiming, automatic focusing, and automatic uh, appendage adjustment, the human eye can function from almost complete darkness to bright sunlight, see an object, the diameter of a fine hair, and make about 100,000 separate motions in an average day, faithfully uh, affording us a continuous series of color, uh, stereoscopic pictures. All of this is performed usually without complaint, and then while we sleep, it carries on its own maintenance work. All by chance. And Charles Dorn, the father of evolution, listen to what Charles Darwin said. He said, to suppress that the eye with all its in animal, I'm sorry, in minimal, uh, contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems freely, I confess, absurd in the highest degree. Seems to contradict everything that he taught. Word. When he looks at the, they didn't even have a clue of how complex the human eye is, is what we have today. Let me just go one, one, one step further, again, talking about, again, teleological evidence. What about DNA? The DNA code. Michael B., the biochemist who helped launch the modern intelligent design movement in 1996, wrote Darwin's Black Box. Let me quote here. Humans have approximately 10 trillion cells. If we unravel our entire DNA, it would stretch 6 billion miles, which would be the same as traveling from the Earth to the Sun 65 times. That, that's, that's one continuous information strand. And um, if, if you were to break it down to gigabytes, you know gigabytes and megabytes, and sometimes when I got into computers, I just wish I got bit by a B-byte, you know? <laughs> gigabytes with big bytes. 1.5 gigabytes times 100 trillion cells equals 150 trillion gigabytes, or 150 times 10 to the 12th power times 10 to the 9th power bytes equals 150 zettabytes. That's even more than gigabytes. 10 to the 21st power. That is, just again, that's the information in our, in our DNA. I'm going to use a word here that most of you did not think you would hear on a Sunday morning. Sperm. <laughs> single sperm cell contains 37.5 megabytes of information stored in DNA, and this means that a single data transfer contains over 1,500 terabytes. This is one sperm. Crazy. One sperm. You know what that, that looks like? If you would take 12 terabytes worth of information, okay, just look at the phone books. That would be 1 million phone books, 150 terabytes. Okay, would uh, actually 1,500 terabytes would be 130 million phone books in one sperm. And the atheists say, "Well, it all happened by chance." Man, come on. Okay. The next is the ontological evidence. Ontological evidence is essentially evidence that occurs from just simply uh, God has placed a awareness of himself in us. So in, in verse 21 of Romans 1, it says, because what may be known, I'm sorry, this is verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. But essentially, what is it saying? That God has revealed himself to human hearts. People have an awareness of God. And so you look at humanity, you'll notice that, that people are 
are naturally religious. They're, they're mankind. In fact, of, of atheists, atheists make up 3% of the world's population. The other 97% believe in some type of God. Maybe not the God of the Bible, maybe not the true God, but they have some type of awareness of, of, of God. The, the atheists, in fact, I'll say this to you, when I was an atheist, I was a doubting Thomas atheist. And I, I would just, I mean, I, I struggle. I mean, how does something come from nothing? I couldn't explain that. How do you have this mass universe that just came out by nothing? And how does living matter produce non-living matter? Right? Living matter is produced right now. So they say, well, non-living matter produced. I mean, you want to tell me to bring two rocks together and we'll introduce them and we'll, you know, we'll give them enough to give them a nice dinner and, and maybe, you know, eventually, you know, maybe some living matter is going to be produced from that. You know, just, I was doubting all the time in my atheism. Why? And I, I've come to see that it's because God was, revealed himself to me in my heart. And I'll tell you this, the, the, you look at atheists, I've never seen a group of people who work so hard to disprove something that they don't believe in. Right? All these atheists on TV who are so hell-bent on disproving the existence of God. I mean, it, it, like I said to you, I'm not here to prove to you that the Easter Bunny doesn't exist because I don't believe in the Easter Bunny. Nor in uh, leprechauns, right? Nor in the Good Fairy. Right? Nor in the tooth fairy, or any other fairies, right? Just it's, it's not it's just not something you would do. So essentially, man has received this innate knowledge about God, it's called ontological knowledge. Now understand this about man. That doesn't mean that he's worshiping the creator. That doesn't mean he's worshiping God in the right way. Essentially, man resists God. He rejects God. He creates God, right? God created man in his own image. What does man do? He repays the favor by creating God in his image. When you look at religions, and I'll tell you this, you can see this in parts of Christianity, God has been created in man's image. Greedy, selfish, and you can see it, you can see it in, 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 all across the spectrum of, of Islam, you can see it in, in, in Buddhism, you can see it in Hinduism, you can see it in Confucianism, you can, you can see it in all the pagan religions, and you can see it even in Christianity. And that is because though God has revealed himself to man, man resists God because of his sin. Last point here, and then we'll close. Moral evidence. Mm. So you have cosmological evidence, teleological evidence, ontological evidence. The last is this moral evidence. And I'm just going to jump for a second to Romans chapter 2, 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these all day, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Who show the work of the law written on their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else accusing uh, or excusing them. Essentially, what is that saying? That Gentiles who do not have the Bible or Jesus, God has written the law upon their heart. And you'll find this that generally human beings have this awareness of what's right and wrong. That doesn't mean they always do right. And, and it, it, it doesn't always mean that they don't do wrong. Because they've been corrupted by their sin. They've been corrupted by a world that is under the dominion of the devil. But generally, human beings have this, this concept of essentially what's right and what's wrong. Right? How many times you know you see movies, the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other? And that's just speaking about the, the conscience of man, that God has put this conscience in them and they have this awareness. Now, again, that conscience can become corrupted. There are some people who believe in loving their neighbor. And there are others who believe in eating their neighbors. And this group is still eating their neighbors. They're one of the last cannibal groups on earth. Most of the Nazis during the Holocaust believed that eliminating Jews was a just and moral thing. Eliminate this, this cancer that has been upon the earth. And many of them felt that they were totally righteous in what they were doing. That's the corruption of the moral nature. The Mayans, Incas, and Aztecs who will sacrifice a woman or a child, rip the heart out, eat it. They felt that that was a righteous thing to do before their gods. Hey, how many people do you see on the left? How many people do you see on the left who feel that aborting babies Aborting the very creation of God in the womb is totally just and righteous. 
once I saw that picture in a magazine, it was a few months after I was saved, I suddenly realized that abortion was wrong and murder. But people are justified, right? It's a woman's choice. And you people, you Christians, who are fighting against abortion, you damn Christians who are fighting against abortion, you're the evil ones. Because you're interfering with a woman's right. You're somehow interfering with a woman's fertility right. And we stand there and, and we say, what about the right of the baby? Hey, is there anybody in this room who wish they were aborted? I've asked that question. Is there anybody in this room who just, go and ask that question to the abortionist. Do you wish you were aborted? I've never seen any human being who said yes. It's the corruption of the human nature. They're corrupt. And they will justify their corruption in all sorts of arguments. They've abandoned God. They've rejected God. Coming to God and realizing that every human life is precious. Every human being from the time of conception has been created in his image and his likeness. But if you reject that, anything goes. So we have a, a genocide of Jews of six million. We have a genocide of people under Stalin of 25 million. We have a genocide of Armenians by the Turks of two million. We have a genocide of unborn babies that now, I think it's hundreds, hundreds of, of, of millions across the world. I think the United States now is approaching 50 million since our UA. How about, how about this? Again, the corruption of the nature. How about pedophilia? Under, under the Greeks and the Romans, pedophilia was totally accepted. You leave and find something unique. And when the church began to become corrupt, there is a link that some of these early so-called bishops were having sex with children. Have you seen that continue for 2,000 years or, or about 1,700 years? But pedophilia was, I mean, it was just, it was considered normal. And by the way, there are people in America who feel that it's totally normal. Hollywood producers, Hollywood actors, some politicians, right across the land now. But again, people will just, that's, that's again the corruption, the corruption of that ontological revelation that God has given. It could be corrupted. But nevertheless, God has revealed himself through the cosmos. He's revealed himself as the designer. He's revealed himself to the very hearts of people ontologically. And he's revealed himself to people morally, whether they've heard the gospel or not. And they will be held accountable for their sins. The people stand before God and say, oh, no, 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 but God, I never heard about Jesus. Oh, but, 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 but God, I never had a Bible. Well, you had the revelation from me to your heart. So here's our, here's our final application. You have wrath, again, that occurs because of rejection. Next week we'll look at the rebellion and we'll look at the rotting. So I just want to emphasize this to you again. Talking about the wrath, there is an eternal wrath. There is a future wrath, and there is a present wrath. And that should wake us up as believers to walking more closely with God, realizing that we will reap what we sow. And to truly seeking Him. And He says, Be holy, for I am holy. But if you resist Him, and you rebel against Him, He will. The principle works. The wrath will come. And the wrath primarily comes, right, because of rejection. And the rejection by the Gentiles of that cosmological evidence, teleological evidence, the ontological evidence and moral evidence brought that wrath upon the nations in its individual lives. I just want to say, we, we are in a special place where we live here in America today because we have special revelation. And the special revelation of hearing the word of God proclaimed. We have Bibles in our hands. A church to go to. And we know about Jesus. And we know his word. And we can receive his grace. But we must make that decision. To put our faith in him.
When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he looked out at the people and he said, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves. Isn't that interesting? Save yourselves from this untoward generation, this ungodly generation. But people make a decision, folks. You make a decision for Jesus, or you make a decision against Jesus. When you make a decision for Jesus, you can be saved. To make a decision against Jesus, or just simply to make no decision at all, you're basically determining your destiny. I always believe God does everything he can to save a man from hell. People send themselves to hell by resisting him. Resisting his love, his grace, and his salvation through Jesus Christ. So would you bow your heads and close in prayer? I pray this day that the Lord may open your hearts, that he may make you aware of him being a God who is an awesome God, and he is a God to be feared. And he has established this principle of wrath in this world that we live in. And when we are in a place of rejection, of rebellion, we will suffer consequences. Awaken us, Father. Let us look out today. If there's sin in our lives that we need to turn away from, that may be causing this wrath to come into our lives, let us turn away from it. Let us turn to your Son in full repentance and Lord God, seek his grace and his mercy while it can be found. Let us put our faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I pray that the Holy Spirit would move upon you. I pray that he would convict you of sin. I pray that if you're comfortable, he would awaken you. I pray that he would bring you to a place of repentance. Lord God, move amongst us. Have your way here today. We thank you, Father, for your word. And I know, Lord God, it's a strong word and it's a hard word. But Lord God, we find that in the scriptures. I pray, Lord God, that the hearts here would be soft enough to receive your word and that you'd be glorified in it. In Jesus' name.